Hi, and welcome to this video. We're going to be going through everything in module 6.2, which is cloning and biotechnology from the OCR A-level biology syllabus. Now, if you're watching this video in 2022, this is a module that has that is going to come up. They've talked about it in the advanced information. Um, so this is something you really need to know well. So we're going to be making a mind map uh, on A3 paper around all these pictures. So if you can, you could print this in A3. There's a link to the blank mind map on my channel. Or if you wanted to, you could take a screen grab of this. I'll just disappear for a second. And then you could print in color on A4, kind of cut out the pictures and use it to create your own mind map. So without further ado, let's get into it. Okay, we're gonna start kind of following the syllabus, following the specification. We'll start over here with cloning. So let's zoom in and let's talk about what this is, what this means, or what a clone is, I think is possibly a good place to start. So what is a clone? Clone is just a genetically identical organism or cell. Genetically identical organism or cell. So we can have clones in animals, we can have clones in plants, we can have clones that kind of occur naturally or we can have clones that occur artificially. So first of all, let's look at plant cloning. Uh, and we'll kind of zoom up here. So plants can clone themselves naturally through um, something called vegetative propagation. So all these methods up here are kind of naturally occurring methods of plant cloning. So natural plant cloning uh, is vegetative, vegetative propagation. And this is basically, in essence, it's basically the plant um, sending out a branch normally underground from its roots and then it's going to kind of become another plant. Um, so uh, there's lots of different kind of subtle different varieties of this um, and they all have, well they all work in a very similar way so we've got things like roots can branch off Uh, and we have lots of different words for the roots, really. We have runners, which go slightly above ground. Uh, here's a runner here between two strawberry plants. We have um, rhizomes. We have stolons. So just be aware of all these words. Runners, rhizomes, stolons, suckers. Uh, bulbs and corns. Um, and then we can also actually have leaves up here. So this is a weird plant uh, and it's like a, called the, what's it called? The calancho plant. Uh, and essentially it has like a leaf, but then it has little baby leaves off the, off the big leaf. Kind of like that, and basically the little baby leaves, that's a kind of bad drawing of a leaf there. That's supposed to be a leaf. But the little baby leaves can kind of drop off and fall off and become their own plant. Runners, rhizomes, stolons, and suckers are all essentially kind of um, roots, basically. They're like roots that kind of can branch off and become their own plant. And why do they all have different names? To be honest, I don't really know, but I think it's it's basically to do with um, how exactly the root branches. Does it go underground? Does it go above ground? Does it go along the surface of the ground? So they're given all these different names, but I think you just need to be aware of the different words. Now, suckers, uh, sorry, bulbs and corns are slightly different. So um, bulbs and corns, and in fact, there's another one as well. I just missed it. Bulbs, corns, and tubers. These are often overwintering organs. So what does that mean? Overwintering. Uh, 
And that basically means that, like, let's say an onion plant uh, in the summer is growing well, it's got leaves above ground, it, photosynthesizing, storing all that sugar from photosynthesis in its um, onion, which is the, uh, the kind of the tuber. Uh, and then in the wintertime, all the above ground plant dies back. You wouldn't find any evidence of the plant above the ground in January, let's say, in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and then in the springtime, then uh, the bulb will sprout again uh, and a new plant will come up. So that's an overwintering organ. Potatoes, onions, stuff like that are all, uh, you know, daffodil bulbs. Those are all overwintering organs. And just what can happen is you can get, you know, multiple plants branching off one overwintering organ, which is an example of vegetative propagation. Okay, so you can make some notes on that. Um, so why? Why do this? Um, question mark, why? Uh, well, it's fast. Remember, um, if you're doing sexual reproduction, you need to find a, a sort of partner. Uh, as a plant, you need to wait for fertilization, that sort of stuff to, happening, to happen. So um, vegetative propagation is going to be much faster. Um, so you only need one parent. To kind of state the obvious, you need one parent. Um, and you can be sure, because it's cloning, um, no, there's no genetic variation. I think I'm going to zoom in a bit here. There's no genetic variation, which means that... Um, Uh, if conditions are favorable, then it's a good thing, you know, big tick, put a tick there. If conditions are favorable, it's a good thing. You make sure that clones of yourself can still thrive and you can reproduce yourself fast. However, if, if not, I'll just kind of try and represent this like that. If bad, then it can, well, if the conditions are bad or if they change, then this is not a good strategy. So if they change, what am I talking about? If I'm talking about like new diseases, uh, climate change, that sort of stuff, then it can be um, bad for the plant. For example, if you want to look up one of the world's biggest organisms is a cluster of aspen trees called pando. Um, it's like many kilometers across, all these trees are clones, kind of connected underground through their, through their network of roots. Um, but these aspen trees that have been there for thousands and thousands of years, called pando, they're starting to die off because of climate change. There's no genetic variation within that stand or cluster of aspen trees. And because of climate change, basically the trees are kind of dying. Um, and that is one drawback of using vegetative propagation. There's no genetic variation and evolution is, is not possible um, because they're all genetically identical. Okay, so that's plant natural cloning. But what about artificial cloning? There are some ways that we can clone plants artificially too. Right, um, <clears throat> so this is natural cloning over here. Uh, up here, I'm going to try and we'll kind of separate here. So everything that we've done on the left there is natural. And over here on the right is going to be artificial cloning. Artificial plant cloning. Um, and the first thing is that artificial plant cloning is actually pretty easy. So it's e way easier than artificially cloning animals. Um, and it's relatively easy. And the reason why, why is it so easy, is because there are Mary stem cells in many parts of the plant. And these meristem cells in many parts of the plant cell, are um, they, they remain totipotent. 
Okay, so there's a term from year 12, which you may have forgotten. So we can talk about the potency of cells, which is how differentiated they are, really. So if, so if a cell is totally potent, it's not that differentiated. It still has the ability to divide into many, many different types of cell type. Um, and then we, you may also remember from year 12 words like multipotent, that's a little bit less potent, or unipotent is a cell that can only divide into one cell type. So these plant meristem cells are totipotent, and we could say they can differentiate into all types. Can differentiate into all cell types. Okay, so that's artificial plant cloning. Why so easy? The two methods you need to know are cuttings. Uh, so this is cuttings. Let's see if I can fit it in here. Cutting. So that's what we're doing here. We're taking a cutting of a plant and then we're basically stick it in some soil. Now it's not exactly that easy. There's a little bit of a few bits and pieces you need to know. Um, and this is, you need, you need to be able to describe how you would do this. This potentially could be a practical thing that could be assessed this year, maybe. They say that they're going to talk about a practical within this topic of cloning and biotechnology. So maybe this is something that, that you need to make sure that you uh, know. So you cut plant, obviously. Uh, now where do you do it? You do it between nodes okay so there are um between you know you cut it sort of between the the, bran the branches you can kind of see in this picture here cutting between nodes uh, and you also do that at 45 degrees i'm going to throw in a little gif here of, of how this is done so between nodes and at 45 degrees is a good idea um and then you um, dip it in rooting powder. So that's a hormone. So let's uh, kind of go across like this. Cut plant between nodes, 45 degrees. Then you use rooting hormone. And that's typically auxin. So you dip the cutting in there. Again, here's another gif for that. Uh, and then you pot in moist soil. So soil with water, and often you you can either cover the leaves with like a plastic bag, or you can make sure that they're in a little special grow box with very humid air. So humid air is essential because that reduces transpiration stress, reduces uh, transpiration. And then you leave until the roots develop, okay? And then when, once you've got the roots, wait till roots. Roots develop, then you're basically good to repot. Okay, then you've got a plant. So you cut plant between the nodes, roughly 45 degrees, sharp blade, actually, I should say. So this is not ideal, actually. Um, you probably use a scalpel, would be best. Sharp blade. Then you dip it in rooting hormone or auxin. Then you put it in moist soil, perhaps with a plastic bag over the top or in some sort of little mini greenhousey type thing, with moist air. And you wait till the roots develop and then you're good to go. You've got a new plant. Right, so that's good. From one cutting, you can get one plant, but there is a slightly more high-tech method which kind of turbocharges your ability to plant clone. And this is called tissue culture or micropropagation. And these terms can pretty much be used interchangeably. So let's put that down here. So tissue culture. Slash micropropagation. Micropropagation. So the Definitions, key definitions from, from my textbook that we use is micropropagation, growing large numbers of new plants from meristem tissue taken from a sample plant. And tissue culture is growing new tissues, organs, or plants from certain tissues cut from a sample plant. So the way I interpret that is micropropagation is making 
many clones from one cutting, which obviously would have um, many advantages if you're a sort of farmer. Uh, and tissue culture is part of part of the micropropagation process. And it involves agar, okay? So uh, we'll talk about why in a second, um, why growers would like to do tissue culture, micropropagation or cuttings, but let's look at the steps, okay? So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit more on this diagram. Okay, so when doing tissue culture, because there's agar involved, things need to be done aseptically. Okay, so, so step one um, is here. Ooh, I just realized I missed a G there. Okay, so I've zoomed in over here. I'm going to put my steps over here. So um, sterile forceps used. to or scalpel, remove growth tip. Again, we've got to have those meristem cells. Then step over two, transfer to agar, sterile agar. Sterile nutrient agar. So the agar has nutrients, some sugars and minerals so that the plant cells can get um, sugars for respiration because they're not going to be able, well, they might be able to do a tiny bit of photosynthesis, but not much. Um, and then we, first of all, treat them with hormones in two stages, three and four. So, oops, three over here. Uh, you use shoot stimulating hormones. And then four, root stimulating hormones. And then you've got lots of little tiny plants. Tiny plantlets. Now actually, I've just realized that in this step here, we've missed out maybe one of the most important steps. So around about here in the middle, somewhere in this bit, between two and three, we can turbocharge this process to produce many more little baby plants. So we, we would have a callus, which is basically a blob of plant tissue, okay? A big old blob, blob of undifferentiated cells. blob undifferentiated cells, which have grown from that meristem. And what you can do then is you can have your blob, imagine the blob is probably wouldn't be this big, but it's grown to maybe this big. And you can just go in again, working sterile, sterilely, aseptically with sterile forceps and cut up that callus into tiny pieces and then move them apart on the agar. And each little tiny piece of that callus will become a plant. So you take your cutting, put it on the agar, grows into a callus, chop the callus up maybe into 10 little pieces, and now you've got 10 plants from the one cutting. This is why this technique is so effective. Okay, so now let's look at the reasons why, um, with the advantages of doing this artificial cloning. And I think actually I'm just going to write down here, we're talking about plant cloning and then artificial Artificial methods, the ones we talked about over here. Okay, so now let's look at the advantages for um, doing these methods using artificial cloning. So the first thing that it is relatively rapid. And the other thing is that we can actually reproduce um, plants that may be sterile. So can reproduce sterile or seedless plants.
So, for example, bananas have been bred to be seedless, like wild types of bananas. We don't have seeds actually in the banana, but we've kind of bred them out. So how do you reproduce a banana? You have to clone it. Um, so micropropagation is used extensively to reproduce bananas. Also, you might, if you're um, like a, someone who's cultivating nice looking flowers, sometimes they make new types of flowers by doing a hybrid between two different species. Uh, and those hybrids are sterile, much like a liger. If you know about ligers, ligers are sterile. Sometimes you get hybrid orchids, for example, that are sterile and you can reproduce them through tissue culture. So that's a big plus. Um, we have genetically identical, you know, um, plants. Which can mean... Uh, that's a plus because it means you, you, know, you know exactly how they're going to grow, you know exactly the conditions that they need, and perhaps you know exactly the phenotype, the, uh, the type of uh, plant you're going to get. So, for example, all apples are produced through cloning um, from, from one type of tree. So, like, every single Braeburn apple you've ever eaten, if you've eaten a Braeburn apple, has been a clone of other Braeburn apple trees. They don't allow apples to kind of, they don't make new apples by allowing trees to pre reproduce sexually because it creates too much variation in the taste and you can get sort of basically nasty tasting apples um so genetically identical so that's kind of um we can just sort of say predictable they're you know predictable condition predictable growth and predictable characteristics um and the final thing is that we if, if a plant has a virus um and but that virus is contained to just one part of the plant if you take a snipping uh, of the tip from a different part of the plant that hasn't got the virus you can kind of produce a new copy of the plant without the virus so that's a bit of a um, an interesting application so um, can um, clone from let's say can clone from a diseased plant so the diseased plant is on its way out it's doomed uh, but we can get a disease-free part of it. Okay, so what are the disadvantages? Well, it is pretty high-tech, so therefore it takes skilled labour. Uh, and those um, GIFs uh, that you that you saw there, you might have seen kind of people working in aseptic conditions. Those are sort of lab-trained people, so it's kind of labour-intensive. It's not so so easy. You need you need them. Um, you need all the right kit. So it's expensive to do. It's way more expensive than, than doing cuttings. Okay, cuttings, anyone can really do with some scissors and uh, some rooting hormone, which you can get off, you know, Amazon or whatever. But um, tissue culture is expensive and you need all the right equipment. Of course, um, because it's a kind of a biotechnology process involving agar and stuff, you have you can lose the whole batch. Contamination is a, is a problem. Um, so we didn't really go into it. The, the details of it but when you're cutting that sometimes when you cut the bit of the plant off um, before you put it on the agar you have to like wash it in kind of bleach type solution to kill any bacteria on the outside of the plant and then you have to work aseptically when you transfer it in um, and if you mess that up then bacteria or mold can grow over your whole agar and then you lose all your little tiny baby plants so contamination is an issue um, and of course uh, we've got, you know, disease susceptibility, the kind of standard. It's called susceptibility. Gosh, that's a tricky one. Susceptibility? Yeah, disease susceptibility. So, you know, one interesting application of this, um, or pop a little news article here, is that, uh, you know, bananas, which I said are produced from cloning, are, they're in danger of dying out because there's this new fungal disease, uh, I think it's called Panama disease, that um, can affect pretty much all the banana plants in the world because they're basically all clones of each other. And there's a real danger that we may lose the current uh, specific type of banana plant that we grow around the world and we might have to go sort of back to the drawing board and sort of do some sort of selective breeding again of banana plants to get a new variety. And actually this has already happened once. We Apparently there used to be an old type of banana called, uh, what was it called? I think it called the Gross Michel uh, that was wiped out in the 70s or something. Apparently it was really tasty, but we'll never know because it's gone because it all got killed some, from some fungal disease. Okay, so that's artificial cloning of plants and finishes off cloning of plants kind of section. But what about cloning of animals? Well, animals are a little bit diff more difficult to clone. Um, 
But of course, you know, uh, natural clones of animals do exist. Here we've got twins, okay? So identical twins. Twins is an example of a natural, natural animal clone. Um, and that's pretty much the only uh, example of natural animal cloning. Um, but there are ways that we can artificially clone animals, and we're going to be looking at those next. Okay, so there's a couple different reasons that we might want to clone animals. Um, so let's talk about those. Um, and the reasons for kind of animal cloning are uh, we can do something called reproductive cloning. And that is just basically to make more animals, okay, to reproduce them. Um, it may be to reproduce some farm animals that have special characteristics. It may be to reproduce an animal that is in danger of going extinct, like a, I don't know, like a rhinoceros. Um, or it may even be to reproduce an animal that has been genetically modified in some way to have certain characteristics, like, for example, you can get goats that produce uh, certain pharmaceutical chemicals in their milk, for example. So reproducing animals by a cloning. So that's one thing. There are some other ways, other reasons. Um, and we can do cloning for research. Or we can do what's called therapeutic cloning, which we'll look at a little bit later. But those are some of the reasons that we might do cloning of an animal. OK, so mainly um, we're going to look at sort of reproduct. Well, the, one of the main reasons is, is reproductive cloning. We're going to look at that now. So first technique, there are two major techniques for reproductive cloning. I'm just going to move across here. And the first one uh, over here is called embryo splitting. So tech, so that's, um, yeah, let's go down here. So this is called embryo splitting. And then, so this is method one. And then over here, We've got method two. And these are the two main methods that we can do animal cloning. Uh, and they differ in a few ways. So first of all, let's look at F embryo splitting. And then we're going to look at this other one, which is called, let's put the full name over here, somatic cell nuclear transfer. Now, if you know a little bit about cloning already, you'll probably think of somatic cell nuclear transfer as like proper cloning and embryo splitting, you might not even consider to be kind of proper cloning, but it is, and I'm gonna to explain to you why. Okay, so we're gonna label this diagram, I'll zoom in, and we're gonna label it in brief, okay? We're not gonna write it out in full, but basically you have eggs from a cow, a cow that you think is great, okay? A cow with excellent characteristics, and you have sperm from a bull, a cow, uh, sorry, a bull that you think is great, has excellent characteristics, or has a track record of sort of genetic history of having um, excellent characteristics and all its offspring. So you've got egg and sperm, and then you have fertilization. So this would be in vitro fertilization. Oops, fertil fertilization. Oops. So now we have an embryo. Okay, so we have an embryo which is like in a Petri dish probably, okay? Now this embryo, we can literally go in and using a very fine scalpel blade, kind of controlled with little dials and stuff, we can chop that embryo up into two embryos or perhaps even four embryos. So we split the embryo, hence it's called embryo splitting. So we divide it. Divide it up. And then each embryo, we probably let grow in the dish just to kind of make sure that it's healthy for another day or so. And then we put each embryo into a separate surrogate mother. So let's put that down the bottom. So embryos into surrogates. 
and a surrogate, in case you're not sure what that means, a surrogate is a another female cow, in this case with a, with a uterus, where we can place the embryo. So basically all these baby calves, these four baby calves here are clones of each other. Essentially they're identical quadruplets, but they'd all be born to a separate mother. Okay, uh, into surrogate mothers. So I think the key thing to think to realize here is that um, calves, in this case, those are the cows, are clones of each other, but not the parents. So there is, you know, the the the, the calves are not genetically identical to either the mother or the father, but it's basically if you have a really high value, really good cow and a high value, really good bull. And you don't want to just get one baby from them. Um, you want to get like 10 because, you know, you're really looking for that characteristics in your next generation in your herd of cattle. Then you can do this method to kind of amplify, if you like, the, the genes from those parents in your next generation. OK. OK, so that's embryo splitting, which is a method of cloning. And the other method is called somatic cell nuclear transfer. So this somatic cell nuclear transfer, this has been done for a while. And this somatic cell nuclear transfer is um, the sort of Dolly the sheep method. So Dolly the sheep was the first mammalian clone. I vaguely remember it coming on the news. There's an institute in Edinburgh called the Roslyn Institute, I think it's Edinburgh, you know, in Scotland, um, that first cloned Dolly the sheep. I'll pop the year down here, 90s, I think. Um, and this is how they did it. They took a, uh, they took this sheep here. Uh, this was, it was a ewe, which was a, you know, the mother sheep was a, well, it's, it was a female sheep. They were both female sheep, okay? But this was the ewe, ewe to be cloned, okay? This is whatever animal they thought was a great animal. They wanted to clone this animal. And this was a um, sort of basically an egg donor. So from the ewe, they actually took udder cells. Now, by the way, these they don't have to be other cells. They just took some, basically some skin cells from the sheep. So I'm just going to write the fact that they are 2N. They are diploid, okay? Diploid cells. This egg is a is an N egg. It's a haploid cell. This is an egg, a gamete. But then what they did, using a crafty base, you know, basically a fine needle, they punctured this egg cell with a fine needle and... They sucked out the nucleus. So we call this now an enucleated, oops, that's supposed to be an L, enucleated egg cell. And that means that it has had its egg removed. Enucleated, I'm just going to tidy that up a little bit. Enucleated, enucleated egg cell, no egg, no nucleus in there. So this egg cell now has zero DNA at all, none. Uh, and they take one of these other cells, which is diploid, 2N, and they basically, they pretty much injected the entire nucleus from this egg cell. I think I have seen some um, articles where it says they put the whole cell in, but it doesn't really matter. They just need to take the nucleus from this U and put it in the egg. So they, and then they fuse them together. fuse together. Now on this this kind of fusion over here, it's an electric shock, okay? Now I've seen in exam papers mark schemes, and you're not allowed to just say electricity, you have to say electric shock or electric pulse or something like that, okay? Now this zap of electricity, uh, you may think, what on earth is that about? Well, it pretty much just like convinces the egg cell that it's been fertilized in a normal way, kind of tricks the egg cell to think that it's been fertilized. Um, and then the egg cell's like, all right, fertilization's happened, time to start dividing by mitosis and become an embryo. So that's what happens. Um, and in to be honest, I've never seen an exam question about this stage. So I'm just gonna, actually gonna remove you know, this, forget about this bit. They just take that egg cell, which is now a zygote, and it turns into, an, and it grows into an embryo. 
if you're wondering what this picture is, especially if you have this textbook, this was basically like they put the zygote in a temporary um, oviduct to kind of allow it to kind of get the natural signals as if it was in an oviduct, as if it was kind of moving down the oviduct ready to implant in the womb. So it was getting chemical signals that kind of kept it happy and kept it dividing. But once the embryo is, is formed, the embryo is put into a surrogate. There's that word again, a surrogate mother. And then we have Dolly. Dolly is a clone. Dolly is a clone of this U. I'm going to highlight here. So here's the U and here's Dolly. OK, so the key thing is that this highlighted sheep here has the exact same DNA as this highlighted sheep here. There is no DNA from the egg donor. Or is there? There is actually a teeny tiny bit. OK, so sometimes you get exam questions saying, why might you consider the fact that Dolly is not 100% genetically identical to the U? I mean, 99.99% identical. However, from the egg donor, there is still just a teeny tiny bit of mitochondrial DNA. I'm going to change the, the colour here. Let's go purple here. So um, this is an enucleated e egg cell, but it does have mitochondria in it still. Okay, because remember, if you know about you know reproduction, um, all of us get our mitochondria from our mothers. I have none of my dad's mitochondria. I have mitochondria from my mother because they were passed down in the egg cell. So the Dolly clone actually does have the mitochondria of the egg donor, but all the other DNA comes from the U, from the U. Okay, so that is somatic cell nuclear transfer. Um, okay, so where are we going to talk about therapeutic cloning? So, um, I think we can kind of fit it in here. So therapeutic cloning, this is this kind of, it could be done using, well, it could only be done using this technique. So let's kind of take it down here. And somatic cell nuclear transfer could be used, used for well, this. So therapeutic, somatic cell nuclear transfer is a method that could be used for therapeutic cloning. So um, here's an example scenario. A couple years ago, three years ago, I was very unfortunate and I actually broke my back. Uh, I'm all right now, but I was, I accidentally did like a uh, a big fall on a snowboard and broke my thoracic 12 vertebrae. Now, I was very lucky and my spinal cord was not damaged. However, if I'd had some spinal cord damage, then potentially I might have um, had trouble walking. I might have been paralyzed. Now, somatic cell nuclear transfer, when used for therapeutic cloning, could offer therapies for this sort of injury. So here's what you do. You pretty much clone yourself. Okay, so in this scenario, three years ago, in Japan, uh, I would have done it myself, but I would have, you know, someone in the lab could have taken cells from me, cloned me, little tiny embryo me, but I wouldn't, then you don't allow that embryo to grow all the way to, um, to become a, a full human being. You just take stem cells from that. Okay, so clone yourself, get stem cells. And those stem cells can be used for therapies. OK, those therapies such as injecting into a damaged spine with the hope that they those cells differentiate and become nerves to kind of connect the gap. Or they could be used to, to kind of re repair people's pancreases or all sorts of other parts of the body. So this is therapeutic cloning. Essentially, you clone yourself to get stem cells. Now, the reason this is so great is the stem cells are genetically identical to you. So I, the stem cells that I thankfully didn't have to use, but they would have been genetically identical to me, so no chance of rejection. Therapies, um, so like put, I'll put no chance of rejection. Now this is not allowed, by the way. Uh, human cloning for therapeutic cloning or reproductive cloning is not allowed, is banned sort of globally. Um, but cloning for scientific research is, not human cloning, but potentially you might clone um, hundreds of mice 
so that your you know your mice are all genetically identical um and i don't know i can't really fit it in up here so i'm just going to do a little uh, a little star let's do this kind of little, little brown star the cleaning for research and down here we'll do a uh, little method here so research and the key thing about cloning for cloning for research is that all animals are again are, are identical or genetically identical so basically this means that you're basically controlling a variable control variables because there is no variation in whatever whatever experiment you're doing there's no variation down to the dna of the organism so you can be more confident in your conclusions okay so maybe you have you know, a thousand cloned mice and you're trying different treatments to see you know see if you can treat some sort of condition in in the mice and it, it probably is something like you can actually breed conditions into mice. It sounds a bit unethical, but that's what people do for research and, and it has moved medicine forward. So you might have bred conditions. You might have mice that basically have like cystic fibrosis because we've kind of created those mice that have cystic fibrosis. You do loads of clones of them and then you can trial different treatments on them, for example. Okay, let's look at a quick um, arguments for and arguments against for animal cloning and then we'll move on. So. Um, for and against so for um, whole herds of animals with ideal characteristics Um, genetically identical copies. Um, we we kind of talked about research already, but the research um, and how should we put that? So effective effective genetics is controlled. Uh, so we can do medical testing we could clone endangered animals or even potentially extinct animals there are scientists working to try and see if they could clone mammoths yes mammoths using frozen mammoth DNA that's been frozen in, in sort of permafrost up in north of Siberia dig up these frozen mammoth carcasses, try and get the DNA out and see if you can clone a mammoth by using a Asian elephant as a surrogate mother. It might be possible and it might happen in your lifetime. Um, so those are the main fours. Main against, uh, well, it's a common thing, but you know, disease again, uh, lack of variation. Um, success rate is low. It's very low, okay? That's one of the reasons that this is not done for cloning of people, because it's just not ethical. I can't remember the exact number, but for Dolly the sheep, before that first Dolly clone was cloned, I think it was like 200 sheep or something that, that like miscarried. So the embryo didn't survive or there was a problem. So the success rate is really, really low. Um, and then there's just kind of ethical issues. Around the embryo and at what point you consider the embryo alive, especially if you're talking about therapeutic cloning, because if you do therapeutic cloning and getting stem cells from an embryo, the embryo would be destroyed. So um, ethical issues sort of, I guess we'll put right to life, question mark of the embryo. Okay, so those are the for and against arguments, main for and against arguments for animal cloning. Great. 
So um, we've just, I'll just pinch out and I'll just look at what we've covered so far. So far we've covered all the methods of cloning for animals and plants, both natural and artificial methods. Um, and we're about to get into biotechnology, which is to do with working with microorganisms uh, or parts of microorganisms such as enzymes. So if you need to take a break, grab a cup of tea and come back with fresh eyes. Now would be a good point. And now let's get into it. Right, so as I said, biotechnology is, the definition is using living organisms. Or parts of living organisms. Um, in, a, in, an, in an industrial process. Okay, so why is this definition important? Well, I've seen multiple choice questions on this, and a key part of it is actually the parts of. Um, so biotechnology can be using a whole living organism, like let's say yeast or a bacteria, or it could be using a part of a living organism like an enzyme. Because remember, enzymes are not alive, they're not a living organism, they're just from a living organism, so they're parts of. So that's why that parts of bit uh, is important. Um, so let's start with talking about why we might want to use um, living organisms in biotechnology. So uh, how are we going to lay this out? I think we're going to go over here and we're going to talk about um, up here, we'll talk about examples. And over here, we'll talk about how. Uh, so this is called an industrial fermenter. So this is how we can use biotechnology. Uh, and maybe down here, we'll talk about advantages and disadvantages. In fact, let's talk about advantages and disadvantages down here. Let's talk about advantages. and disadvantages. So this is kind of the why. So yeah, I think it probably makes sense to start with the why. So let's focus on the advantages and disadvantages. So the main advantages is that microbes are cheap and easy to grow. Uh, they also work at kind of room temperature, so low temperature and pressure. Because the alternative to using microorganisms is to use industrial chemical processes where you might have to use high temperatures, high pressures to kind of drive the reaction forward. But if you're using a living organism, you've got enzymes doing these reactions inside the living organisms and they work at low temperatures and pressures. Um, so you can do it anywhere. Um, fermenters can be built anywhere. I'm going to look at this tank above in just a second, and you can put that anywhere, uh, irrespective of climate, as long as you have, you know, a, a, a room and you have the ability to modulate the temperature of the tank, you can, you can do it anywhere. So, uh, if you didn't use fermenting technology like this, maybe you could only do it in certain parts of the world, basically. Um, they can, so microorganisms can be fed things like agricultural waste, so for example, I don't know, maybe you grow some corn and the, the top of the corn plant, the actual corn itself, the sweet corn or the maize, that gets used for one process, but the stalk is a waste product really. No one uses the stalk for anything, but you could chop that up and feed it to microbes um, to maybe get some extra kind of uh, income if you're a farmer for, perhaps. Um, and they reproduce quickly over a short life cycle. Uh, 
Um, I've kind of run out of space. I'm going to put some up here. No, eth no real ethical considerations. Because, you know, no one really cares about microbes. They don't have, they're not sentient. They don't have brains, complex emotions. So we don't, we don't really have to think about the ethics of killing bacteria or not. Um, and generally, products are easy to, um, to isolate, to, to get uh, from the growth culture medium. Now, there are some disadvantages as well. So, um, and often these disadvantages are to do with specifically when um, using microbes to produce food. So this, let's put kind of a food brackets around this. So risk of, of contamination, and this is actually for, for all uses of biotechnology. If you're growing bacteria and the wrong bacteria gets in your tank, you're gonna grow the wrong thing. So contamination risk is a big risk. Uh, you may produce the wrong product, you may grow the wrong food, and you may even potentially harm people or kill people if you think you're growing um, a single cell protein to feed people, but you accidentally grow botulinum bacteria, you could kill a lot of people by mistake. So contamination risk. Um, so isolating uh, protein. If growing microbes for protein uh, can be sort of difficult. <clears throat> and again, this is all about food. Um, SCP has a high, a single cell protein, high purine content, which is a type of nucleic acid. Um, which has to be reduced. Reduced, so it's reduced. So purines, uh, purines are the bases, adenine and guanine. And basically if you have a high purine content in your diet, you can end up getting gout. So I'll maybe put a little side thing here, gout. Gout is like a painful extremities, painful fingers and toes, typically uh, presents in people who have a really, really rich diet. Um, and potentially, if you're growing microbial protein, again, this is all about food, really. Um, you might have to additives required to make it taste nice. Uh, so we might use the word palatable, which means do people like to taste it, okay? So we talked about advantages and we talked about disadvantages. And the disadvantage has often been about uh, use of it to food. So I'm just going to link that kind of around here. Because one example is single cell protein, S single, C cell, P protein. All right, so let's look at some examples of how biotechnology has been used in the food industry for many, many years. Okay, so first of all, bread uses yeast. And I think you should be familiar with the term Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is the microbe that is used. Gosh, I'm going to struggle to spell this double C. So that is a single-celled fungus. So what's actually going on with the yeast? Well, basically the yeast takes glucose in dough and respires it anaerobically into ethanol plus CO2. And actually it's the CO2 bubbles that give the, the bread texture, okay? You get, you get the rise. 
So sometimes bread is leave, left to prove. If you watch Bake Off, you'll notice it's left to prove in the proving drawer, which is typically a, a warm environment where the yeast can really res, um, respire and grow well. The, the dough kind of inflates as the CO2 is produced. Any ethanol, which is in the dough, because you might be thinking, is bread alcoholic? Well, the ethanol, when you actually bake the bread, will um, kind of evaporate off. So uh, I'll just write evaporates. That's the main stuff about bread. So bread is one example. Uh, another example is cheese. Cheese is a biotechnology product. Uh, so how is cheese made? Well, cheese um, is mainly made using a bacteria called lactobacillus. And you may rec recognize the prefix lact there to do with milk, like lactose and lactase and lactobacillus. So anything with lac is to do with milk, or the lac operon, for example. So how does lactobacillus work? Again, it's, uh, it kind of respires, it breaks down the sugars in milk. So it takes lactose and converts it into lactic acid um, and I think uh, an ATP, you know, it uses the ATP. So the lactic acid, this stuff, that lowers pH And then there's another product also used, well, another, another enzyme used, which is renin, renin. Which is an enzyme. So remember, this also meets the definition of biotechnology, which is living things, lactobacillus, and parts of doing things, the enzyme. And then it basically separates out the protein from the, um, from the milk. So uh, you may have heard of the nursery rhyme, like, about little Miss Moffat sat on a toffet eating her curds and whey. So curds and whey refers to the first step of the, of the cheese making process. Um, so let's put it up here, shall we? Um, so milk coagulates, which means it kind of separates out. And we have the, I'm gonna change color, the curds is the solid and the whey is the liquid. Now the curds get turned into the cheese. Okay, the curds, the solid curds get pressed. Um, and if you kind of use the curds quickly after they've separated out from the milk, you've got stuff like cottage cheese. And if you press it and leave it for a long time to dry out a bit, you get stuff like cheddar. And you can, if you want to, um, where am I gonna put this? So. Um, when you figure out where to put this, curds go into cheese. And you can also add mold. I'm gonna put a little side note, blue cheese has added fungus. So the blue mold in like blue cheese is often a mold called penicillium rock 40. And they actually insert the mold into the cheese to give it more flavor. Beer. Beer uh, is again made using uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So I'll just shorten the, the terminology there this time. So S cerevisiae is how you can write it shorthand, cerevisiae. So it's the yeast again. And again, it does this thing, respires anaerobically, takes glucose and turns it into ethanol and CO2. Glucose into ethanol and CO2. But in, if you're brewing beer, the CO2 provides the bubbles of the beer uh, and the ethanol provides the alcoholic content. Okay, so um, beer is the product of fermenting some liquid. Now, basically, if you want to brew something, you have to have a liquid containing some sugar. Um, haven't really seen too many questions on the syllabus about this, but basically, if you have grape juice, that's a sugary grape juice, and you add yeast, it turns into wine. Beer is typically produced from barley grains, um, and those grains are allowed to partially germinate, so they get more sugary, and then you kind of boil them up, and you've got a liquid of sort of sugary water that can then be fermented. Okay, so that's beer. 
Um, we've also got yogurt as another example. Um, yogurt. And yogurt is very, very much similar to cheese. So again, it uses lactobacillus. Um, but in this one, um, the milk does not, there's no rennet or renin added. So lactobacillus um, acidifies the milk and then so pH drops. Uh, proteins denature, which changes the texture of the milk. Um, and then we kind of just leave it there really. Uh, and then it's yogurt. Sometimes in certain yogurts, other um, other, uh, other bacteria may be added. So just a little side note here, um, things like um, sort of healthy probiotic drinks, probiotic drinks. Why is that like that? Yeah, so probiotic drinks have other bacteria added. Uh, and these might be bacteria that have been identified as being beneficial for the intestine uh, or somewhat beneficial. Um, okay, so that's beer, yogurt. Um, oh, one little side note on this renin enzyme, which is used in cheese. Remember, cheese and yogurt, very similar. This renin enzyme, traditionally, that has come from, uh, from calves' stomachs. Okay, so there's a sort of ethical consideration, I guess, there. Calves' stomach. Um, so some cheeses are not considered vegetarian because they use this renin enzyme, which has come from calves' stomachs, and these calves have been slaughtered. Um, but you can actually get renin enzyme that's now been genetically um, been like genetically modified into bacteria. Um, so that's, I guess, another use of biotechnology. And now this means that lots of cheeses are uh, vegetarian um, and do not require the extraction of the enzyme from from cow stomachs. OK. Right. So the final example we need to look at is single cell protein. So this is another way that we can use biotechnology in food production. Um, and in this one, the product is the microbe. Okay, so in the other ones, we in the other uses, we were mainly using a microbe to cause a chemical change, such as convert glucose to ethanol, such as convert lactose to lactic acid. Uh, but in this one, we really we want the microbe. So single cell protein um, could be uh, a single cell fungus. So in corn, the example corn. Uh, there's a, a fungus, a fun um, is it single cell or is it multiple cell? I think, yeah, fungus venetatum. Yeah, it is a single cell. So um, the corn one, I don't think you need to know this, but maybe worth recognize, is called Fusarium venetatum. And it basically grows in a tank. You supply it with nutrients, it grows in a tank. Um, getting more and more biomass and then you basically drain the tank and collect all the cells and kind of squish them into a mold and you eat them essentially um, so that's how you do it now you may as I said below you may need to reduce the purine content of that single cell um, protein before it's kind of um, safe to eat large quantities of you may need to add additives and stuff like that but it is a generally fairly healthy source of protein that can be produced anywhere. Okay, so it's pretty pretty good. Now, one really exciting technology um, that, who knows, they could ask a question about it. I've, I've never seen it yet, but it's sort of a hot issue in biology, is something called air protein. Uh, I really encourage you to go Google this, air protein, check it out. Um, and this is uh, a, a bacteria that is being developed by a Finnish company. Uh, and I'll just, this is off syllabus, but it could be an application thing. So I'll just talk about it for a second. It's a bacteria. You feed it H2 gas plus CO2 gas. That's all it needs. And it grows. Okay. So the H2 is supplied by electrolysis of water. You use renewable electricity, hopefully, to separate water to produce hydrogen gas. And CO2 comes from the air. So it's kind of like artificial photosynthesis, because remember in photosynthesis, you also split water 
called photolysis or photolysis. But in this uh, microbiology process, you need electricity to split water, feed hydrogen and carbon dioxide to bacteria, and they grow and they produce a protein-rich flour, which is can be added into um, human foods or can be used to feed animals in agriculture. So this is an interesting technology which you may hear more about in the future. Um, one little aside before we talk about how people might grow corn or air protein in an industrial fermenter below, right over here, is that for some micro, um, microbiology and biotechnology products, they're kind of self-limiting. So you may wonder why wine is around about 12% alcohol. Well, it's because at 12% alcohol, uh, yeast dies, roughly, okay? So if you want to get anything more alcoholic than about 12, 13%, you have to do distillation. Um, and that's why wine is generally around that because you allow the wine to ferment as much as possible. So you start with grape juice, lots of glucose, 0% ethanol. As the yeast grows and respires, more and more ethanol builds up, keeps building up, keeps building up, and then the yeast starts to struggle, I guess, probably when it gets around 10, 11%, keep going a little bit more, but then by the time the alcohol gets to 12% concentration in the bottle, the yeast, the yeast are gone, no more fermentation happens, and that's the maximum alcohol percentage in a brewed beverage. Anything higher uh, has, had, has been distilled, okay? Right, so so far we've mainly talked about examples that are in kind of food and drink production. But biotechnology, of course, is not just used for food and drink production. So I think we should maybe make uh, a couple brief notes on other uses um, of biotechnology. Now, cheese, yogurt, uh, bread, these are kind of biotechnological processes that are I would say not really done under high control scenarios. They're often the containers and, uh, that are used to kind of brew or make these products are kind of um, are, are sort of less rigorously controlled and they're more sort of um, processes that have been done for a long, long time. Things like brewing. Brewing would be done in a brewing tank. Things like corn, uh, making single cell protein. This would be done in a, in, a, in a fermenter. So we can call brewing tanks or you know, corn tanks. We call them industrial fermenters. So they can be used for producing beer and, and corn, but they can also be used to produce other microbial products. So I'm going to kind of branch other products off of this. So this is going to be a few other examples. Um, we can have drugs. Um, so this is examples as well, I guess, down here. Examples two, non-food. Okay, so we can have drugs uh, such as Penicillin. So penicillin is a product that is made from a mold. Uh, as an antibiotic, it's made from penicillin mold, penicillin fungus. We can have other antibiotics as well. Penicillin is one antibiotic, that, but there are others, such as, I don't know, erythromycin. There's another one. Um, we can have things like insulin, human insulin. So insulin would be, uh, and we can probably put a little side note underneath this. Let me just zoom in a little bit more. So insulin um, would be uh, GM bacteria would be used. Um, and then we have lots of enzymes, all sorts of enzymes. I'm branching down here, enzymes which we can uh, extract from living organisms. Uh, so protease, there's loads of examples. Uh, protease, lipase enzymes, sucrase, amylase, lactase. Uh, and we'll give some examples of these when we talk about immobilized enzymes uh, later on. Uh, and other products as well, such as uh, citric acid, which is a food additive that's produced by uh, bacteria in industrial tanks such as this. Um, biogas uh, and other products. Okay, so all of these other products, drugs, penicillin, antibiotics, insulin, enzymes, citric acid, biogas, they would probably be, be produced in an industrial fermenter. So this is kind of a high control um, growth vessel for a microbe. Now here's a gif of, um, uh, of an industrial fermenter which I found on the internet. 
Um, and it shows a couple things. It shows people kind of checking uh, the tank, it shows you the scale of the tank, it shows people looking at the tank, looking at readouts of the tank, it's very highly monitored. Um, it shows, um, I think, some of the, uh, you can kind of see into the tank and see some micros being sort of churned around, and it gives you an idea what this kind of thing looks like. Now we're going to label um, a diagram of one of these industrial fermenters uh, right here, uh, to sort of show you how the bacteria growth is kind of uh, optimized. So here's a diagram of uh, that kind of gift that you've just seen. So this, this could be, you know, many, many meters tall, uh, or it could be sort of smaller and kind of, you know, sitting on a, on a bench top, depending on the scale of production that the company or scientist is trying to do. So let's start with, um, let's start with these central uh, things here. These are the mixing blades. So often when you're growing a, uh, microbe in a, in a liquid, it might settle to the bottom. So the mixing blades kind of allow the microbes to kind of be constantly wafted around the tank so that all the microbes get roughly the same amount of oxygen and nutrients and some don't settle to the bottom where they're more likely to kind of be in competition with each other and, and sort of die. So we have the mixing blades um, powered obviously, obviously by a motor that rotates the, uh, rotates the blades around round at a, at a set rate. Um, we obviously have to feed in um, nutrient medium. So this is nutrient medium uh, inlet. So where it goes in. And the key thing here is it would have to be sterile. Okay, so when you put in your nutrient medium, it has to be sterile, which means there are no contaminating microbes. If there were contaminating microbes going in there, then you're going to grow the wrong microbe and it's going to be, it's going to be terrible. Okay. You, you might produce the wrong product or if it's food, you might kill some people, which would be obviously terrible. Um, so the nutrient medium inlet sterile. We've also got to have an air inlet as well. So that's here, air inlet. Um, I'll just write over here, air inlet. And again, of course that has to be sterile. Okay. So I don't know exactly how they do that. Sterile, sterile but uh, they might have to have some sort of very fine mesh filters that can filter out any particulates and maybe some sort of UV light or something, intense UV light, or maybe even some kind of gamma radiation or something that would sterilize the air. Those are my ideas. Um, okay, so what else? That air, of course, has to be bubbled. So this is kind of bubbled through the tank. So we can imagine bubbles kind of rising up through the tank here. And this has a sort of slightly weird um, term. It can be called a sparger. Sparger. So a sparger is the, the air bubbler. Okay, that's what it is. Bubbles air. Or potentially another gas. Remember I talked about air protein before and said that um, that, that specific bacteria, which is grown in the air protein process, needs hydrogen and carbon dioxide gas. So you could, of course, put other gases through a sparger that bubbles and mixes through the culture. Um, okay, what else have we got? So we also have, um, this is quite interesting, this kind of water around the tank is a kind of water jacket. So water in, uh, and then water out. Now it's important to say that this water doesn't mix with the inside. No, no, it just maintains the temperature of the tank. So it's essentially like a water bath for the tank. It maintains it at an optimum temperature. So let's say that your microbes in here are respiring, they're generating a lot of heat. Uh, so maybe you put in water at, I don't know, 36 degrees C. This is just an example. And maybe it comes out at 38 degrees C because it, and it's taken some of the heat energy out. Uh, and maybe therefore it maintains the temperature in the tank somewhere, you know, around about 38 degrees C or 37 um, degrees C. That probably wouldn't be a great example because generally we don't culture things at body temperature because there is a risk of um, growing pathogens. That's actually something we need to know about later on. So, um, But you get the idea. So the water in and water out, I'm going to cross out those figures, um, but it kind of maintains optimum temperature. Let's put it that. Maintains optimum temp for that microbe. So maybe the optimum temperature for, for yeast, if we're brewing beer, is different 
than for genetically modified bacteria producing insulin. It probably is. Um, and we control the whole thing very carefully via sensors. So here are some sensors. And they detect all sorts of things. pH is monitored. Temperature is monitored. Potentially uh, minerals can also be monitored, like sodium, potassium, chlorine. Those kind of ions can be monitored. Anything you want to monitor, you can get a sensor in there that monitors it, essentially. Um, what else? We also have a pressure outlet valve here. I'm just going to label it like that, pressure outlet. So some, uh, in some fermentation processes, you have gas produced, such as beer brewing, you have carbon dioxide produced, and maybe pressure builds up and you might need a little valve, one-way valve that can only let air or gases out of the tank one way, so it wouldn't let contaminants into the tank. Uh, and then finally, you have an outlet for draining the fermenter. That's at the bottom. Um, I'll label it on this side just for space. So outlet uh, to drain tank. So you might drain the tank to get the um, to get the product out. Now, a little bit later on, we're going to talk about batch versus continuous. Okay, so. In a continuous culture, um, maybe we could talk about that here actually. So in a continuous culture, um, I'm just going to go off to the side here. Con continuous, the uh, nutrients in equal the product out all the time. Okay, so. Constantly, you're adding nutrients in, maybe a few liters a day, I guess, maybe, and you're draining some product out a few liters a day, or you're draining the mixture out a few liters per day. And that means that you get a constant rate of microbial growth. The microbes are growing in um, log phase, more on that in a second. And you get a constant rate of microbial growth, and it's good for primary metabolites. And in a batch culture, um, where are we going to talk about this? Down here somewhere. And in a batch culture, um, we, mm, I'm going to put it in blue here, so we drain the whole tank. I'll talk more about that later. Okay, in batch culture, we'd have to drain the whole tank and then set the whole tank up again, um, and we do that every few weeks or so. Whole tank, let it grow, finish, drain the whole thing, start again. Okay, so let's move down here and look at this graph here, because I started to talk about log phase, um, and we should focus on this graph here. This graph shows, I'm not sure if you can see here, the population size of a bacterial culture. Okay, this over here, if you can't quite see that, it says population size of a bacterial culture. And this is time. So when you put in uh, bacteria into a new growth medium, they go through a few different phases. First of all, we have something called lag phase. And in this phase, the bacteria are basically just like getting used to their new scenario, getting used to their new setting. Um, and there's also low numbers of bacteria. So low numbers, um, sort of acclimatizing, we could say. And just to link this to module 6.1, maybe if it's bacteria, maybe the bacteria are having to turn on or turn off genes to get acclimatized to a new environment in a similar way to the lac operon, which you hopefully have studied. So low numbers acclimatizing uh, genes, genes on off, I'll just say, okay? That's lag phase. Now, once the bacteria are, have started to divide by mitosis, sorry, not mitosis, binary fission, 2 to 4 to 8 to 16 to 32 to 64 to 128 and so on, we get logarithmic growth. So this is called log phase. Could be called log phase or exponential phase. And we're, du we're doubling very quickly. Um, so doubling. And remember the figure that you need to know is as quick as, this is the fastest, 
as every every 20 minutes. Ah, now, little side note on this whilst we're here. They can double as quick as every 20 minutes, okay? And they recently, the syllabus was updated uh, a few years ago um, to include the following formula, okay? Which is the formula for the size of a bacterial population after a certain amount of time. So the size of the population, M, big N, is equal to N0 times... 2 to the n, where 2 to the small n, where little n is how many doubles? Okay, I recently saw um, uh, an exam question on this, and it said something like um, 100 bacteria were placed into a tank at the start of its growth. The bacteria was left for, I think, 12 hours. And the bacteria could divide every 20 minutes. How many bacteria were there at the end of the 12-hour period? Well, what you first had to recognize is that each hour contains three 20 minutes period, 20 minute periods, 0 to 20, 20 to 40, and 40 to 60. So, so in one hour, the bacteria can double three times. So in 12 hours, it could double three times 12 equals 36 times, okay? Now, you could just kind of try and do this on your calculator, but it would be quite long. You could do 100 times two, times two, times two, and keep going 36 times, or you could do the maths, and you could say that um, big N equals N zero, which is the starting number, uh, 100 times, 2 to the power 36. Okay, uh, I haven't got a scientific calculator on me right now, but you could do that yourself. It's going to be a massive number. Um, billions and billions of bacteria, maybe even trillions. So um, that is how you would do that sort of question. So log phase, exponential growth, you can use this formula to kind of work out the size of the population when it's growing in exponential, uh, exponential phase. Now you might calculate some number. You maybe count, work out whatever this number is. And then the follow-up question might be, well, a scientist investigated the bacterial population and it, they were nowhere near that, that number. So what happened? Well, potentially the bacteria reached stationary phase. So those 100 initial bacteria, they started dividing and dividing and dividing, but at some point stationary phase kicks in. And stationary phase is where some factor is limiting to growth. So it could be a lot of stuff. Um, it could be, you know, probably oxygen, maybe, maybe nutrients, food, glucose, whatever it is they're eating. Kind of a bit like photosynthesis where you just have to say that a factor is limiting. That's what's going on here. A factor is limiting. Now, um, if bacteria are kind of kept in stationary phase for a while and kind of nothing improves, then we can get death or decline phase. The population is decreasing. Basically, bacteria are dying. So this is like a some factor is even is even less in abundance. So death or decline phase factor is is severely lacking. Some factor is severely lacking, and bacteria are dying. Um, so that's how uh, a bacterial population will sort of grow, reach a plateau, and then decline. So sometimes we actually want bacteria to be in stationary phase. I talked a little bit about um, up here, um, this idea of batch versus continuous culture. And I talked about continuous culture. Continuous culture is when the bacteria are growing in log phase. So we keep the bacteria happy, we keep supplying them with nutrients and they keep growing exponentially and we keep harvesting a product. Now, but sometimes, we actually want our bacteria to be reaching stationary phase, okay? So this could be if we are trying to harvest something called a secondary metabolite. So batch culture, which I'm just gonna quickly highlight up here, batch culture, to get, um, batch culture is used 
when we need to get our bacteria into stationary phase to produce a secondary metabolite. So I am going to branch off and go, um, let's go down here, okay? I'm gonna go down here. Okay, so we're gonna talk about batch culture down here. We talk, started talking about different types of culture up there, but let's talk about batch culture. So essentially what we do for batch culture is we, we seal a tank, seal the fermenter, and then we wait. And then we drain it. Drain the whole tank. And then we redo the whole thing. Why would we do it like that? Continuous culture seems much more I don't know, it just seems more smooth. Well, it is smooth, but it won't work for all processes. So batch culture, we need to think about a, a graph. And we're going to have uh, the production here. And we're going to have time here. I'm going to do two lines on this graph. Let's have a purple line for mass of some microbe. Let's say it's a fungus. And, you know, it gets quickly going into exponential phase and then it kind of reaches a stationary phase and then it kind of plateaus, okay? Um, now, this would be the fungus growth, okay? And the fungus that I'm talking about and thinking about is penicillin fungus. Penicillin fungus produces penicillin. But the, the, if I had to put a line in for the production of penicillin, It would not exactly mirror the fungus growth, and it would actually look a bit like this, okay? So penicillin is a secondary metabolite. I'm just going to move down here. Secondary metabolite. And a secondary metabolite is one that is only produced in um, stationary or death or decline phase. Okay, so you can kind of think of it like um, a kind of a bacterial or a fungal weapon. So it's only produced when the fungus is under stress, when it's feeling intense competition, because penicillin is a chemical that is produced by fungus to kill other microbes. So there's no point in the, in the fungus producing that chemical if everything's good. If everything's good, why waste resources producing this kind of weapon? Um, you're only going to produce it when you need to. So penicillin, secondary metabolite, um, we could say produced uh, when competition is high. So you could not produce penicillin through continuous culture. You have to do batch culture, essentially, what you do is you, you start the tank, you let time run its course, and you get to here where you've got your maximum amount of penicillin, you drain the whole tank, and then you're gonna set it back up and you're gonna repeat, okay? You're gonna repeat the whole culture process again and again and again, uh, and that will enable you to get a secondary metabolite. Batch culture, there are a few advantages, well, the few advantages of it, of it, it's the only way you can get secondary metabolites. So this is advantages of batch culture when compared to continuous. Um, there's less risk of contamination because you're, well, even if you do contaminate, you're only going to spoil one batch and not the whole thing. Uh, and the disadvantages is basically uh, time, time is wasted, okay? Because you're not growing bacteria 100% of the time. Sometimes you're emptying a tank cleaning it, sterilizing it with steam um, and resetting it. So it's, it's a little bit time inefficient, okay? Right, okay, so this is getting to be a really long video. I think this might be the longest one I've ever recorded. And as you can see from my frequent costume changes here, this is my third day of working on this video. Um, we've got a few little bits to do. So if you wanna take a little break, grab another cup of tea, this would be a good point. If not, we're gonna get into um, practical aspects 
of aseptic technique. Now remember, this is something that's going to come up uh, potentially on the exam in 2022. Um, and they have said that practical skills may come up. So this could really be quite important stuff. Let's get going. So when working with any microbe, when working with biotechnology type stuff, aseptic technique is very important. Okay, so I'm going to uh, put a few uh, GIFs around uh, of people using aseptic technique. I'm going to talk about what you can see those people doing. So whenever you're working aseptically, um, first of all, you have to close doors, close windows to prevent drafts. So let's just put uh, bullet point the main major features. So close doors and windows. And that's because if you have air movement in the room, it's blowing bacteria around and that bacteria is more likely to contaminate anything you're working with. So we close doors and windows. We sterilize the hell out of everything. Sterilize everything. Okay, so working, surface, working surfaces. Um, you wash your hands as good as possible. You roll up your sleeves. You tie up any ties. You tie long hair back if you have high, if you have hair, uh, long hair. That is, sterilize everything. Um, sort of hair back, etc. And if possible, you can actually work in, in a sort of um, like a fume cupboard. It's a, it's not a fume cupboard that's really designed to extract chemicals, but it's a it's actually a um, a, a fume cupboard that it's a positive flow fume cupboard. So actually the air comes out of the fume cupboard. It's a little bit of a te uh, technical thing here. I'll draw a little one here if you really want to know what I'm talking about. But if that's the fume cupboard, basically filtered air uh, is passed into the fume cupboard and then it comes out of the fume cupboard. So if you accidentally cough, <coughs> Instead of your cough particles going into the fume cupboard and landing on your stuff, the filtered airflow means that no microbes go into the fume cupboard and settle on it. So, um, but we don't tend to work with those in schools. So hair back, sterilize everything. We need to work quickly and efficiently. Um, we basically don't touch, don't put anything down as much as you can. Um, because if you put something down, imagine if this was sterilized, and I'm trying to plate some bacteria. If I put it down, it's now not sterilized. So you have to keep things moving, you have to keep them in the air. And if ever you need to re-sterilize, you, you use flaming. So flaming to sterilize. And lids on and off super quickly fast and also lids at an angle so we can see some um, things going on up here uh, so actually let's just so here we've got some flaming so I'm going to label that one we've got flaming to sterilize there uh, two we're also flaming to sterilize the lid of the bottle so that's one plus two put that there this is picture two this here is showing transferring some culture by picking it up on the um, by the inoculating loop. Now, actually, this is not a septic technique, but there is a there is an error here which you can get asked about. So I'm just going to put a little star here. So when you're transferring your culture, you want to wait and make sure that this loop has cooled down before you dip it in your bacteria. So uh, I'll just put here wait to cool because if it's not cooled down um oops wait to cool then basically the bacteria that you dip in um are going to be killed because they're going to be burnt uh and sort of then you won't have any bacteria to plate on your next step so and then again we're flaming again here when we close the initial bacterial pot so this over here this um inoculating loop is now used to plate uh, a Petri dish.
Um, and this is called an inoculating loop. I'm going to try and fit it in the middle here. Inoculating. Loop. Uh, and when we inoculate a plate, which is just putting the microbes on the plate, we typically wave it back and forwards in this kind of streak pattern. Uh, and then we will re-sterilize the inoculating loop and so on. Now, when you would be plating the Petri dish, I've just got an empty blank Petri dish here. Imagine my pen is the inoculating loop. What you would do, uh, and I'll just angle this down, hopefully this works. What you would do is you would open your lid like this, and then you would plate your bacteria and you would close your lid. You don't want to take it off like that because then that, of course, means that bacteria can settle down on it. You want to just open it at sort of 45 degrees, plate, and then close, and then you would use your Bunsen flame to re-sterilize your inoculating loop. Now, there is a practical that is that uses aseptic technique that I feel has a strong chance of coming up this year, and that is a serial dilution and dilution plating practical. And it's used to determine um, the, the amount of bacteria in a culture. Okay, so it, it uses aseptic technique. So this is called a dilution plating experiment. Uh, and let's first of all just say, you know, what's the reason uh, to determine the number of viable bacteria, and that word is important, in culture. So viable means basically alive or bacteria that are able to go on growing and set up a new colony. So for example, with my class, we recently did this practical uh, and we modified it slightly. So we used Yakult. We bought Yakult from the supermarket and Yakult claims that there are 20 billion bacteria per bottle. Now Yakult is a probiotic drink. We talked about those earlier. So are there really 20 billion viable living bacteria per bottle or have some of them died or is this number off? How would you go about working this out? Well, you can't count them. They're far too numerous. Um, and you can't even take a little sample of the Yakult and squirt it on some agar because there's too many bacteria in even a tiny drop of this to really count. So what you have to do is you have to do a serial dilution. So hopefully this is familiar uh, from like year 12, for example. So what you do is you dilute uh, times 10. So this is your starter culture here, start, uh, and we use Yakult for this. And then we dilute it times 10. So this is a 10 times solution, or you could say uh, 10 to the minus one dilution, because it's a 10th of the original culture. And then you would dilute it 10 to the minus two, which is a 100th the concentration of the original culture. And then you dilute it 10 to the minus three, and 10 to the minus four. You might even go on to 10 to the minus five, 10 to the minus six. So this is one tenth, one hundredth, one one thousandth, and one one ten thousandth dilution. So we could all, we could call this also a 10,000 times dilution. So I'll write that here, 10,000 times dilute. Okay, so hopefully you know the maths of how to do these dilutions, but you would take one mil of this starter culture and add it to nine mil. Uh, so maybe before you take this and put it in here, you'd have nine mils of sterile broth. You'd add the one mil, you'd mix it about, not with your fingers, under sterile conditions, and then you'd have 10 mil of your dilution. And from that 10, that dilution, which remember is uh, one tenth of the starter, you then take one mil of that and you move it into the next tube where your nine mil of sterile broth is waiting and so on. You take one mil of that, you take one mil of that, you add it to nine mil and you do it again, one mil of that, add it to nine mil. Okay, so you've got your dilutions set. Right, why have you done this? What do you do next? Well, you have agar plates ready to go and you take a small sample of each dilution and you put it on an agar plate. Small sample might be something like 100 microliters. It could be 200 microliters, but certainly underneath one mil. You need to remember that one milliliter 
is equal to 1,000 microliters, okay? Just like one millimeter is equal to 1,000 micrometers. It's the same prefix. So you take 100 microliters of each solution and you, and you plate it on your, on your agar and you wait. Uh, you wait 24 hours. So uh, let's label that. So uh, culture in incubator for 24 hours at 32 degrees C. Remember before I said we don't culture in schools at 37 because it's likely to grow pathogens. So at schools we normally use 32 degrees Celsius, which is considered safer, less chance of growing pathogens. So that could be an error in someone's experimental method that you could have to listen out for. Oh, they did it at 37, that's dangerous, they shouldn't have done that. Okay, so what we typically get then is uh, on this plate here, you can see it is packed full of bacteria. Look at all those green bacteria growing all over the place. You actually call it a bacterial lawn. I'll give you that word, lawn of bacteria, which basically means there are so many bacteria that you can't count them. They're just all over the place. They're spread all over the place. This one's quite lawnish as well. This one, we're starting to see individual colonies. And this one here, we can see the colonies. So let's count the colonies. Excuse me while I count. I think I counted 18 colonies. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that in the 100 microliter solution, dilution that I put on that plate, there were 18 bacteria that landed on the plate that were viable and that started to grow. So I can use that to work out the number of bacteria here, which is the whole point. So how do I do the maths? Well, there were 18 in 100 microliters of the 10 to the minus 4 dilution. So, therefore, you would say there were 18 times 10 in 1 mil of that dilution because there are 1,000 microliters in a milliliter. So you'd have to, the 100 microliters, you could fit 10 of those in a milliliter. So that equals 180. So 180 per mil. Okay, 180 per mil in this dilution. But that dilution was 10,000 times more dilute than the start. So therefore, if you do 180 times the 10,000, you get the starter concentration, which is, uh, what is that? That is 1.8 million. 1.8 million bacteria in the original broth. Now, sometimes you get this written as CFU, and CFU stands for colony forming unit. So 1.8 million uh, colony forming units per mil in this original broth, okay? So remember, the whole point of this is to kind of work out how many microbes you have growing in a, in a culture. Now, one thing that you might get asked about is, um, you know, slight tweaks to this method. So what if, for example, what if you did your 10 to the minus four dilution and this 10 to the minus four dilution was still, I'll just draw it in here, all streaky all over the place? A lawn. Well, that would just tell you that you would have, you should have repeat. You should repeat the process and maybe do another dilution, a ten to the minus five and a ten to the minus six dilution. Okay, so that's one type of question that you could get asked about that. Or potentially, another question might be: How about you did a ten to the minus five dilution? I'll just quickly sketch it there. Just imagine another set here, and on this one, you only get I don't know one colony. So that might, they might ask you then, well, where is it better uh, to take your count from? Maybe one or even two colonies. Well, what's basically happened here? Remember there were 18 colonies there. So you would expect 1.8 colonies in this one, wouldn't you? Because it's 10 times less, 10 times fewer. But, you know, if we round 1.8, probably sometimes we get one colony, sometimes we get two. So where's better to take the reading from? Probably better to take the reading from here. Um, 
like 18 is is more accurate than either you'd either get one or two. So if you're reading either one or two and then doing the maths, you'd get either one million or two two million CFU. Whereas if you read from here, 18, it's a bit more clear. Maybe if you could be bothered to count all the colonies here, you'd get exactly 183 colonies, which would give you a more precise value, a more accurate value for your um, CFU per mil. So there's a kind of balance between do you want to try and count all the tiny little dots if it's possible, or do you want to count fewer dots? Fewer dots is more error prone due to random kind of rounding. More dots is more difficult to count, if you see what I mean. Okay, on to the very final bit. Hooray, we're almost there, which is this kind of last bit of biotechnology, which is enzymes. Okay, so remember that the definition of biotechnology is using living organisms or parts of living organisms in industrial process. So we highlighted this parts of statement. And that parts of statement really links to down here, immobilized enzymes. I'm highlighting there in the background before I write on it, immobilized. Oops, I put two eyes there. You can correct that. Immobilized enzymes. So remember, enzymes are parts of living organisms. They're not living, they're not alive themselves. So that's why using immobilized enzymes is considered biotechnology. Now let's zoom in. Okay, before we talk about um, the different methods of immobilizing enzymes, maybe we should talk about the advantages. Okay, so I'm going to put advantages of using enzymes over here. Now remember that enzymes and biotechnology in general is good because um, it means we can make things at kind of low temperatures and pressures. So, so we've already kind of covered why enzymes are good or like whether they are used in a living thing or whether they're used separately, they're good. We know that. But why do we want to immobilize them? Well, first of all, I suppose we should say that immobilizing means um, stopping them moving. Okay, we want to fix them to something. So why would we want to fix an enzyme to something? Well, there's a few reasons. First of all, they don't mix with uh, products that they make, okay? So they are stuck somewhere, so they don't mix with products that we make, which means it's easier to separate the product from the enzyme. If the enzyme's stuck to something, a physical surface, the product is easier to get out. So don't mix with products, uh, easier to get product, easier to extract uh, the product, P for product. Um, the other thing is it makes continuous processes more easily. Because um, we can, for example, let a liquid flow across a surface that has enzymes stuck to it, and the liquid comes in containing substrate, and it leaves containing product. So we can just let a continuous flow happen. Um, and the other thing is that if the enzymes are stuck, um, reusing enzymes is easier. Uh, and the last thing is that the enzymes, when they're immobilized on some sort of surface, it makes them um, res more resistant Uh, to temperature changes slash pH changes, basically more resistant to denaturing. Okay, so what are the different methods of um, enzyme immobiling? Immobiling? Immobilizing. What are the different ways that we can immobilize an enzyme? So number one, we have adsorption. That's up here. And let me zoom in a little bit more. So adsorption, we basically stick an enzyme to uh, a, some sort of particle, clay particle. And adsorption um, is, is sort of more temporary bonds, okay? Temporary bonds sticking to the clay particle. So these bonds 
maybe things like ionic or hydrophobic interactions that are kind of more temporary, um, temporary bonds such as ionic. Uh, I suppose hydrogen would would possibly be a, be an option or um, hydrophobic interactions. Okay, so potentially the, the enzymes can come unstuck from the clay, clay particle. This says clay particle in the middle there. So it's kind of easy to do, but potentially the enzyme comes unstuck, um, which means it leaks into the reaction mixture. So kind of pluses, easy, negatives, maybe not so very permanent. The second thing that we'll look at, I think, is covalent bonding down here. I can't remember why I put them in this order, but I want to look at this one next, covalent. So covalent bonding is what it says. It's covalent bonding. So it's more uh, more permanent, but potentially more expensive. So the negative of this is that... Um, it can mean that these covalent bonds here, you can imagine that a covalent bond might accidentally kind of go above the active site or on top of the active site. So it might reduce the activity of the enzyme because covalent bonds may bond over the active site, kind of blocking the active sites. So I'll put that here as well, may block active sites. Or alter AS, I'll just write AS for active site. We can also do something called entrapment or to give it its full name, membrane entrapment. Oops, that's the wrong one, sorry, my bad. We can do entrapment in some sort of gel. So here we have the enzymes, these little, little pink things are the enzymes, and we have some sort of gel um, or matrix or network. So we could use cellulose fibers, for example. Um, that just hold the uh, enzymes in place. So they're not sort of physically connected, but they're just in some sort of web and they're kind of tangled up um, in a cellulose mesh, for example. And the other thing is that we can have them behind a membrane. So this is membrane separation. So in this case, maybe the enzyme molecules, the blue ones here, and then we wash, you know, our substrate through, but then the substrate can, it breaks down into product and then the product can exit the mem through the membrane, but the enzyme itself is too big to go through the membrane. So this is another way of immobilizing the enzymes. Okay, so a couple of quick examples of this. So let's go to here, examples. Um, of... I'll just write IE for immobilized enzymes. So we've got glucose isomerase is an enzyme that can be used and it converts uh, glucose into fructose. So one hexose into another, but fructose is a bit sweeter than um, glucose, which means if you convert sugars from glucose into fructose, it sweetens the sugar, so you can use less of it. So it's often used in diet food. We can um, make lactase. And lactase, remember, converts lactose into uh, glucose plus galactose, remember, um, lactose is a disaccharide, and that's useful for people who cannot digest lactose. They're lactose intolerant. So uh, they can have milk that has been processed by you basically pour milk over some immobilized lactase enzymes, and then you get lactose free milk. Uh, and then you've got some other stuff amino acyclase. It can produce amino acids for chemical synthesis. We 
We've got glucoamylase. And glucoamylase converts starch into glucose. And it means that you can digest starchy foodstuffs like starch from corn into glucose. So like, for example, high fructose corn syrup is a product used to, um, to sweeten Coca-Cola. So you have corn syrup that is high in starch and you first treat it with glucoamylase to produce glucose. And actually then you treat it with glucose isomerase to turn the glucose syrup into fructose syrup. So there's one example of how both of these processes can be used. And the final one is called nitrile hydratase. And this is used, it converts nitri, nitriles to amides. And this is quite chemical. I don't, I, don't, I don't think you need to notice this detail. Nitriles to amides, but it makes monomers um, for use in polymerization. And the polymer that can be generated from this is something called polyacrylamide, which can be used in many different products. Right, zooming out, that was a big one. I've gone over the bounds of my mind map here. I hope you managed to get it all on one page or several pages. That is everything in OCR module 6.4, cloning and biotechnology, which remember is coming up in 2022 if you're watching it then. Uh, and remember, you do need to be aware of various practical techniques in this unit. So that could be practical techniques for making a cutting or for doing tissue micropropagation, could be aseptic technique, serial dilution, or even um, potentially the practical techniques in cloning. So uh, best of luck in your upcoming revision. Hope this was useful and see you next time.